Well, good morning on this fourth Sunday of the new year. Good morning. Good morning. So we are a month in, and so those of you that uh, have had and made New Year's resolutions, how you doing? You still res resolute? Still doing well? I remember uh, after the beginning of the new year when my technology, like my phone and my computer, made the shift from 2015 over into 2016, that I started to get all of these pop-ups inviting me to upgrade my software. This upgrade would promise to make my phone as well as my computer run faster. It would give this sleek, cool new look. It said that I would have access to apps that would help organize and manage my life and make it run smoother. It also promised that it would take care of glitches from, from pre-existing software to make it run better. All of this happens with the touch of a button. Now, as I was upgrading my software, I thought to myself, what could happen if we had the ability to upgrade our lives to be the absolute best version of ourselves? The person that God created us to be. We could be uh, the new and approved 2.0, so to speak. What would happen if there was a way to upgrade our own life so that as we move through life, it could even help with the glitches? our temptation, our sins, our suffering, so that we could live this new and improved version? Or what if there was a way that when we did live into the best version of ourselves, we tapped more fully into the fruit of the Spirit, where we lived with a sense of joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This morning we kick off a new sermon series entitled Thrive where over the next several weeks, we are going to learn how it is that we can partner with the movement of God's Spirit, how it is that we can live having God's Spirit breathe within your life and mine, partnering with the movement of the Holy Spirit so that we are living fully into the best version of ourselves, the one that God created who knit and formed and fashioned you in the womb of your very mother, who gave you a sense of purpose and plan for your life, one where we do not languish, but one where we flourish and thrive. When we live a life in which we thrive, we find that we are in harmony with God, we're in harmony with creation, we're in harmony with others around us, and we even are in harmony within ourselves. We realize that every once in a while, we catch these glimpses that surprise even us that we have been created for more. For example, some of you may be in a meeting and you say something inspirational. Others of you may help a homeless person and no one even notices. You might find that you have greater patience with a rambunctious child. You might be generous. You might be compassionate. You might say something that you know did not come from your own mind, or you might refrain from saying something that you know you would like to say. And you catch this glimpse of the person that God created you to be. We realize that thriving is not measured by how much money you make, or the accomplishments that you have, or your sense of attractiveness. To thrive means that you are becoming more the person that God had in mind when he created you. If we're to define what it means to thrive, it means moving towards God's version of the best of you. And so the question is, how do we do this? How do we partner with God in this process so that we can partner and be a part of God's movement here on earth? Well, the first thing that we do is we realize that God created you in a unique way. You have been created by a one-of-a-kind, almighty God that God delighted when he formed and fashioned you. It would be like uh, an acorn growing to be an oak tree. Now, one thing we know about that acorn is that it's never going to be a rose bush. 
Now, it might be a lavishing and it might be a thriving oak tree or it could be a stunted oak tree, but it's never going to be a bush. We see that when God created you, God formed and fashioned you in such a way, so much so that he has pre-wired your temperament. He's determined your natural gifts, your talents, your abilities. He made you to feel certain desires and passions around things that actually excite and engage your soul. He's planned your body and your mind, and he has designed you for a purpose. Some people think that if they're to go spiritually, then they're going to have to become another person. But God does not create you and then discard that which he created, but he actually repurposes it. For example, before Paul met Jesus, he was a brilliant passionate zealot who persecuted people and afterward Paul was a brilliant passionate zealot who actually sacrificed himself for people our unique design can be revealed all throughout our life and if some of you have the pleasure of raising children or grandchildren perhaps even seeing it in niece and nephews throughout life you can catch glimpses of the unique person that God has designed. There's a story of a friend who has a daughter by the name of Shauna. And Shauna was one of those quintessential strong-willed girls. She was four years old, and evidently she kept going AWOL on her tricycle. And so her mom was very frustrated and said, here's the deal, I'm gonna set some boundaries. Over here we have a driveway, and over there is a tree. Now you are more than welcome to stay between the driveway and the tree. And if you don't, then you need to know that I'm going to spank you. Now I have things that I have to do. I'm going to go inside. I can see you through the window. So I know, Shauna, I know what you're doing. Remember, between the driveway and the tree, or you get a spanking. Four-year-old Shauna quickly turned her rear to her mother and said, well, you might as well spank me now because I've got places to go. <laughs> Four years old. Now, would it surprise you to learn that Shauna grew up and to this day she possesses formidable leadership capacities and an indomitable drive? She will always have them. You see, God doesn't make anything and decide to throw it away. Now, when our sin gets involved, what happens then is that God comes in and he rescues and he restores and he redeems us into the person that he would have us be. For us to thrive, we are to stay connected to the gift of God's spirit we cannot do on our own. And if we're to be honest, we feel that there are somewhat of two versions of ourself. We know that there's this sanctified version of this person that God has created us to be, and yet we know that there is the version of us right now. With all of our sin, with all of our muck, with all of our struggles, with all of our brokenness, and so there's this gap. And the problem is, is that we have a desire to get over, to live the life that God has called us to live, but we struggle in knowing how to traverse that gap. For many, we think it's simply up to our own ingenuity. If I could read another book, if I could simply pray more, maybe if, if I learn some more spiritual disciplines. But what we fail to realize is there is nothing that we can do of our own accord to mustard and traverse this gap that exists. Instead, we learn that the only way that that gap is filled is when you and I learn to live by the very grace of God. You see, God's plan for you is for daily for you to be guided and guarded and energized by this grace of God. And that happens when you and I live into the flow of the Spirit. You see, in our scripture this morning, God showed the prophet Ezekiel a vision of languishing. He showed him an entire valley of dry bones. And God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? To which Ezekiel answered, only you know, O God. And God did indeed know. 
He knew that he made them and for them to come alive, that he was going to have to infuse them with the very gift of his spirit. Now, when we hear this scripture read, it should seem a little bit familiar. In fact, it might invite us to consider Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and the creation story, when it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. We read in Ezekiel 37 simply 10 verses, 1 through 10. And in those 10 verses, nine times the Spirit of God or the breath of God is used. In other words, God is prophesying through Ezekiel that until God's Spirit flows through your heart and through mine, you and I are simply flesh and bone. We realize and even know what it is to have a withered and worn out and tired spirit. And we wonder why. Only to realize as we peer into the prophecy of Ezekiel himself that God's spirit must blow and rejuvenate and help you become the person that God intends for you to be. Even the word inspired has this spirit root. It's a word that literally means that something has been breathed into us. Our main job is to stay connected to the flow of God's spirit at work. And when this happens, we realize that we gain something from the outside being that of God's spirit, which ultimately transforms us inside And we respond with a sense of vitality. When we are living to be the person that God calls us to be, what happens is that manifests itself out in the world as we live beyond ourselves to make a difference to those in need. In the field of medicine, there is a diagnosis and it is known as FTT. It gets entered into the chart of an infant, of uh, one who is unable to gain weight and to grow. It is known as a failure to thrive. Oftentimes, physicians don't know exactly why a child is responding in this way. Some believe, well, maybe the mother was depressed and that depression got passed on to that infant. Others think maybe something's just not quite right with the metabolism, so this child is not able to grow. But what psychologists have begun to speak of is perhaps the largest mental health problem in our day. That it's not anxiety or depression, at least not at clinical levels, but it is a languishing. It is a failure to thrive. You see, God uses the prophet Ezekiel to speak to the people of God because he knew that he was dealing with a community of individuals who were failing to thrive. They were languishing. And by so doing, they found themselves hopeless, without meaning and purpose. The context of Ezekiel is actually set up in 597 BCE. What has happened is that they are in a Babylonian exile. The Babylonians came, they uh, sieged Jerusalem, and when they did, they took the best and the brightest, and the most educated, and the most attractive, and the strongest individuals that they had, and they exiled them to Babylon. Now what was going on is not only the physical crisis that they are experiencing, but they're also experiencing a spiritual crisis. Because when it came to Israel's faith, everything that they had known was now in jeopardy. For Jerusalem had been sieged. The temple is now gone. Its people, even the Davidic monarchy, is now in question because they are in Babylon. And at this time, there's this idea that if Jerusalem could be sieged and overcome, then maybe, just maybe, Babylon's deity is greater and stronger than God. So what God knows is that this entire community of people are suffering from a failure to thrive. That they begin to question and wonder, can God be trusted? Is God faithful? And so God uses Ezekiel the prophet to prophesy 
to speak life, to take that which appears withered and worn and dead, to bring it new purpose and to bring it new meaning. You see, languishing is the condition of someone who is not able to function. And what I mean is they live without a sense of hope, without a sense of purpose, without a sense of meaning. Even the seven deadly sins talk about this, but they use the word acedia, which means a weariness of soul and an absolute inability to delight in life. And we use this in our language. We talk about a dead marriage or a dead-end job. Languishing is the opposite of thriving. Over time, uh, there was a study that was done by uh, a gentleman who went to a group of kindergartners. And he said to those kindergartners, how many of you are artists? And everybody's hand went up in the class. The exact same gentleman came back when these students were in the third grade. How many of you are artists? Half of the hands went up. He revisited again them again when they were 12. How many of you are artists? To at this point, only two to three hands went up. You see, it is hard work for us to be in the process of growth. And there are times when temptation will ask us to simply become complacent, to don't put in what it takes in order to sit back and just be languishing rather than thriving. God has created you to grow. And the reason that this is so important, the reason that you are to partner with God and the flow of God's Spirit to be the best version of you is because God designed you to be a part of His redemptive plan. You see, when you languish, when you do not thrive nor choose to be the person God created you to be, we're the ones that get shortchanged. Because your gifts are different than another person's gifts. Your passion and what stirs your soul is different from somebody else's. And God plans to use you and the other person. And how we're connected as the body of Christ to give a glimpse of the kingdom of God on earth. And so when it comes to thriving, how is your soul? Do you find yourself languishing? If you're to truly be honest, would you say that your soul is worn and withered and has been in a valley of dry bones for a long time? Because if this morning that's where your soul is, take heart, brothers and sisters, for we call out to dry bones this day to come alive. We call out to dead hearts this day to come alive. That we would come up out of the ashes and let us see an army rise. For we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ, partnering with the redemption of God in this world. And God chooses you to be a part. So thrive. Thrive. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.